Thanks, Hannah. Uh, can we give a hand to all who are serving this afternoon? Thank you so much, worship team, all the way to the guys in the room, those who are doing the cameras as well. And I, I heard that there were some new ones today trying out. Uh, and maybe some of you might be thinking, hey, how come the, the camera angle a bit not so nice or not so there? It's okay. It's okay. We're all learning together. And isn't this like our faith? Sometimes, you know, we fall into it, we fumble and we make we mess up. But at least we step out and try and learn and grow together. So we, let's give a hand to all those who are serving. Really appreciate you, whether in the hall or outside the hall. So Shalom Next Gen. Uh, I just want to uh, thank... Uh, Pastor Wilson for giving us the opportunity to share the word and uh, on behalf of Pastor Joey uh, he will want to say that he loves you all very much and I also want to say that I love you guys a lot and so today we're going to continue on our first Timothy and first and second Timothy series entitled Disciple Makers Journey if, if this is your first time here with us I'm John part of the team here at Grace uh, and I have a very first question to ask everyone here in this room and that is have you ever found it difficult to extend grace to difficult people. Have you ever found, if you, you have, you can turn to the person beside you and say, yes, that person is not you. If, you. if your answer is no, if you're thinking to yourself no, then honestly, high chance that person is you. So we continue with our first and second Timothy series, and today we will be looking at chapter 5 and chapter 6. See, Paul was writing to Timothy to extend grace to all within the faith community, teaching him how to lead and relate to different groups of people in the church. And the title for today's message is The Disciple Maker's Compassion. The Disciple Maker's Compassion. And if you're writing notes as well, do write down the big idea. It says here, God desires us to extend grace towards all. God desires us to extend grace towards all. And I have two main points over there, and, and 36 sub-points. Oh, those not paying attention. Ah, oh, it's okay, let's go. Let's go, let's go. So my first main point is this, to extend grace to fellow disciple makers. To extend grace to fellow disciple makers, and we're going to go through First Timothy 5. As we go along, there are some key things I would love for you to take note of. So in order to extend grace towards one another, we need to first treat fellow disciple makers as family. We need to first treat fellow disciple makers as family. It starts here in verse 1 in chapter 5. It says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. See, Paul's instructions to Timothy was to treat all believers as family members. And in their culture then, where authority was used to dominate or mistreat others because of status and position, Paul taught Timothy to choose the way of compassion and encouragement as one to his fellow family members. Out of love, respect to your fellow disciple makers. See, how many of us consider ourselves to be older men? Daring a bit, lah. those who are older here can... Ah, yeah, yeah, there we go. A few, uh, young men, raise your hand, it's good, that's good. Uh, soon you'll be old as well. See, as we age, as we grow older, the truth is this, as it gets harder for us to receive feedback or to be corrected, especially if it's not done in a kind manner. And the word used here, rebuke, is actually translated as to strike someone with sharp and harsh words. So instead of striking someone older with harsh words, Timothy was to esteem the older men as fathers when correcting them. In other words, to use gentle persuasion to speak to older men. And likewise, in relation to younger men, to treat them as fellow brothers and encourage them to follow the correct teachings. As for older women, Timothy was to treat them as mothers, to give honour and respect when exhorting them. But as a special highlight for younger women, it says here, Paul told Timothy to treat them, those sisters, as sisters with absolute purity. Absolute purity, specifically referring to sexual purity. 
which meant that there needed to be a degree of separation for Timothy when interacting with younger women, presumably to guard against the possibility of sin. So all the men in this place as disciple makers, please obey the word of God. This is not some old school thinking, this is ancient school thinking. We need to protect not just ourselves, but also our fellow sisters in Christ. To uphold them with absolute purity. So it starts first, as we extend grace to all, it starts first with treating fellow disciple makers as family. Then we need to care for those who need help. See, we continue in the next segment on widows within the church. It says here in verse 5, She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. Having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Wow. If we read it from our current worldview, Paul's words would definitely seem very harsh. However, as we approach the Word of God, we must dig into the context then and the audience that Paul was actually addressing the letter to. You see, the, the Ephesian church that Timothy was leading, the, the issue that they had was that there, were, there was a large number of widows that were enrolled in to receive help from the church. However, Paul told Timothy that there's a criteria. You need to have a criteria. And the criteria was that she needed to be left alone, hopes only on God, prays regularly, must be at least 60 years of age, woman of one husband, good reputation, raise children, show hospitality, wash the feet of the saints. My feet need a bit of washing now. Care for the afflicted, devoted to every good work. Why? Why, Paul? Why, why is there a need for this detailed list to be qualified in order to receive help? Well, given the finite resources available within the church, Timothy was tasked by Paul to discern between widows who truly needed help and those who did not. See, based on what Paul will touch on later on, he will actually cover later on to show us that there were widows in, in their midst who were probably abusing the kindness of the church. And in that ancient Greco-Roman culture, culture, it was a patriarchal society where men would be the ones that work, go out to work. And families were typically all living together like grandparents, Parents, children would all live under one roof. So for a widow living then, this meant that it would be harder for her to go out and find work. And worse, if she did not have any family to turn to, she would be in danger of starving to death. There was no such thing as financial assistance, no CPF, no CDC vouchers like us today. A true widow or a real widow, as Paul describes, was someone who not only lost her husband, but also older in age, 60 years at least, that's what Paul said, and truly deserved to be supported financially by the church. She had to be someone without any family support and demonstrated godly character through prayer and service to others. But Paul, are you telling us that if this lady comes to church, she's a widow and she's 59 years old, are we going to reject her? Of course not. Because if we look at the Word of God in James 1.27, it says that pure religion, true religion is caring for the widows and orphans. See, the main focus of Paul's instruction was for Timothy to exercise discernment in stewarding the limited resource by helping those who genuinely needed help. So we continue with verse 4, it says here, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an un believer. Strong words there. You see, for widows with children or grandchildren, it was uh, the family's duty and responsibility to take care of them. Paul used the phrase, show godliness to their own household, 
which means that godliness was seen through one's compassion towards a mother or a grandmother who was a widow. And Paul continued with some strong words that if anyone does not provide for his or her relatives, especially within the household, this person has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. See, it was a cultural norm then for the unbeliever, those not of faith, to take care of their own family members, especially those in need. So Paul is saying here, how much more those who are believers of our Lord Jesus Christ. For a person who professed to be a believer of Christ and not take care of their family, this actually made them morally worse than those who were outside of the church. So the family must be first in taking care of those in need, especially the widows here in this context. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, family first? See, there was another group of widows that were addressed by Paul. They were creating a problem in the community there. And we read in verse 6, it says, but she, addressing the widows, she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. Let me break break it down for you. Firstly, there were younger widows who lived the self-indulgent life. Life was all about pleasuring themselves. They would use whatever means they could to get what they wanted. And Paul's instruction was to refuse these widows for any help. For what they did was actually drawing them away from Christ. They were physically alive, but spiritually dead in Christ. Secondly, the word indulgent had sexual nuances attached to its meaning. And some scholars even believe that these young widows were going around prostituting themselves or remarrying outside the faith to get what they wanted, therefore ultimately abandoning their faith. And thirdly, because they were young, idle, and had no work, They would go from house to house to gossip and slander about others. So Paul's suggestion, as they were still young, was for them to remarry within the faith community and to manage their own households. And the question we all ask would be, why is there a need for distinction for these widows? Well, the answer is in verse 16. It says here, If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. See, Paul is trying to prevent the church from being burdened. As as much as the church was a compassionate bunch of people, very giving, very charitable, the reality was that they could only give from the limited resources they had. And from the passages we, we just read, we learned two principles from what we just read. Number one, the church should only provide for those who are truly in it. And number two, the family should always be the first to be responsible for those in need. So we continue, we move on. Another way that that Paul describes here that we can extend grace to fellow disciple makers is through the way we respect those who serve and work with us. Respect those who serve and work with us. Verse 1, chapter 6, it says, Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have been believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. See, Paul taught that slaves should honour those in authority over them and reflect God's teachings in their conduct. 
And this principle applies regardless of the master's faith. See, through honouring their masters, slaves could be a powerful witness, especially to the non-believing masters. And if both slave and master shared the faith, their spiritual bond should inspire even more dedicated service and kindness to one another. Why? So that the name of God and teaching may not be reviled. See, in all relationships, regardless of social status, whether slaves or masters, believers had the opportunity to represent Christ well. And their behavior contributed to upholding the gospel. See, this approach encouraged slaves to view their roles and relationships as opportunities for spiritual impact, emphasizing the broader significance of their daily conduct. So similar for us today, are we serving and working in a manner so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled? Because our conduct must be consistent with our conviction of God's word. Our conduct must be consistent with our conviction of God's word. So what do we need to do? See, friends, we need to show compassion to fellow disciple makers. We must show compassion to fellow disciple makers instead of seeing one another as just the other person sitting on the other side of the aisle or this acquaintance. It all starts with treating one another as family, with love, honour, respect and dignity. It, ex it extends to caring for those in need with much wisdom and discernment so that we provide support to those who truly need it. Because you and I, we are able to make a difference in the lives of others as we extend grace towards all. See, a couple of years back, there was a Gracian couple that I know, and they got married just a, a couple of years back. And they moved into their new home, brand new home. Uh, they had three bedrooms. So one bedroom naturally was their own master bedroom, and then there was a study room for them to do their work and naturally a third room, which they converted into a guest room. They, put, they furnished it, they put in furniture, beds and, and cupboards and different things just to furnish this place. And they wanted their home to be a place where others could experience a space for themselves. So they began to open up their homes to different people in church, actually. When they found out that there was another couple that just got married and haven't had a place to move into yet, they reached out and said, hey, why don't you come over? Stay at our house for a short while. We can, we can, if you haven't found a place, take, take our, our room here. We have an available room here for you. They allowed this couple to live in their home for a period of time. And this Gracian couple even went out of their way to go and purchase a cot, a baby cot, because they wanted to let a young family, family uh, a young family of uh, one baby, to stay in that room. So they went all the way out, they purchased a cot, furnished that place so that this family, this young family could stay with them and they stayed with them for up to two months in their own home. See, imagine having another family or another group of people staying with you in your own place. It's definitely not convenient, not comfortable. Yet this couple opened up their home. They were ready to be compassionate, to show compassion to fellow disciple makers by opening up their home to others. They were truly treating other fellow disciple makers as family. See, God desires us to extend grace towards all. And there's something that we all can do today to care for those in need among us. See friends, our passion for Jesus must be consistent with our compassion for others. Our passion for Jesus must be consistent with our compassion for others. The world is looking at us when we say we love Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I believe He's the way, the truth and the life, and yet the world is looking at us, the church, to look at how compassionate we are towards one another and beyond our walls as well. So if we say that we love Jesus, that we are passionate about Him, then show it to one another with the compassion for each other. The second main point is this. Extend grace to leaders of God's household. Extend grace to leaders of God's household. 
And the first sub point is honor leaders who serve faithfully. We see this in 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. It says here, let the leaders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you must not, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. See, the elders here being used, mentioned here, do not refer to older men, but they refer to those who are leading the church. And Paul is telling Timothy, give them double honor. And while it honestly feels a bit uh, difficult for me to say this because it refers to those who lead the church and are full-time, ensuring that the workers are paid a proper wage, Paul emphasized this through the quotation of Deuteronomy 25 when he says, to not muzzle an ox in the Old Testament. And he also quote Jesus in, in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus uses this as well. So in other words, it is of high importance that those who served and led the church be taken care of, especially those who were teaching the word. <clears throat> amen. Amen. Oh, the, the amen very loud. Amen. And this made a clear distinction. Why? This made a clear distinction between false teachers who did not lead but came to disrupt the faith community with heresies. So you could distinguish between those who led the church well and those who were false. The second thing is restore leaders who need discipline. Restore leaders who need discipline. It says in verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. See, Paul told Timothy to rebuke and restore leaders who needed discipline. And if anyone were to admit a charge or to bring an accusation against a, an elder, it had to be done in the presence of two to three witnesses, similar to a court setting, so as to avoid malicious slanders. And Timothy here, he had to discern and demonstrate impartiality to all parties. However, if an elder was resistant and chose to persist in sin even after private intervention, whether it's like preaching heresy or an outright sinful lifestyle, Timothy was to publicly rebuke this elder. And the purpose of this public rebuke was not meant to be a punishment, which may, we may think it is, but it was to instill a healthy fear of God so that the rest of the elders may take warning that their actions will be held accountable. And this would also prevent further instability to the larger church community. Friends, in this same manner, this is what we ought to do as a church today. To raise issues that we have with leaders or even one another in a godly and biblical manner. And we've all witnessed this before when someone may be very unhappy with a particular leader and instead of bringing another leader or a few witnesses to speak together, we start talking about this leader to others. And what happens from there? We, things begin to spread wildly, quickly, and a broken telephone happens. What started off as actually a small issue could potentially become a major problem within the faith community. And instead of approaching the issue in a godly manner, before witnesses, the reality is some of us, we just prefer to talk behind backs and remain anonymous. Or maybe some of us, we prefer to air our grievances online. We just go to our social media and then just post this long post, don't put names, but show our unhappiness and do all kinds of description. The guy wearing the denim jacket on stage, wearing the transparent glasses, always wearing, uh, I don't know what else, white t-shirt. That guy, that guy. I'm not happy with him, you know? And we do all kinds of things to describe, but don't call it out so that if people ask you, who are? Ah, I cannot say it, I cannot say it. I cannot say it. Are you referring to the guy? I cannot say it, I cannot say it. Yeah, it's, it's just something between me and God. See, we air our grievances. We tell our side of the story. We do all these things, hoping that the world will finally know and realize how bad this person is. But friends, while it makes us feel shook and appeased for a moment, 
by publishing all our unhappiness. This is wrong. This is unbiblical. And it does nothing more than tarnish the reputation of the gospel. It gives those outside the faith a perspective of how divided and fragmented this community is. So I want to encourage us. Let's approach any issue within the church in a godly manner. Bring it before another leader or pastor with other witnesses and trust that the Lord will lead in this. Instead of taking it aside anonymously, doing it on our own, let's do it as a community, as fellow disciple makers of Christ. See, finally, Paul touched on how to raise leaders within the church. He taught Timothy to appoint leaders and disciple makers who are trained and proven. In verse 22, he says here, Do not be hasty in the laying of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. And the sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. See, verse 22 tells us that Paul wanted Timothy to not be hasty or to rush in raising leaders. The laying of the hands was a symbolic act of commissioning publicly the leaders that you want to raise within the community. And as such, Paul was implying that Timothy, if Timothy were to raise leaders very quickly and they were to mess up and sin against God and have a lifestyle against God, Timothy, you are responsible as well. You're complicit. You are sinning against God for doing this. Even though they are the ones who sin. You are responsible. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. So in order to keep himself pure, Timothy was to choose and to train his leaders and disciple makers wisely. See, verse 24 and 25 tells us that Timothy should appoint leaders who have gone through training over time and had proven themselves to be worthy to lead because good character may not immediately be obvious. And this is especially important given the context of the many problems the Ephesian church had that originated from the elders and their heretical teaching along with their sinful behavior. So let me summarize this segment about leaders. See, when we extend grace to leaders of God's household, we need to honor leaders who serve faithfully, restore leaders who need discipline, and to appoint leaders and disciple makers who are trained and proven. And one effective way of extending grace to one another is through the way we establish accountability with leaders or with each other. We need to establish accountability with leaders or with one another. See, we have seen many different influential pastors over the years being involved in different scandals and just this year alone, there were a few big name pastors that withdrew from ministry. And if these well-experienced pastors in ministry could fall from grace because of a lack of accountability, how much more us? in our walk with God. We need to establish accountability with leaders and with one another. And the word accountability means giving an account to others about what we've been going through in our lives. To be open, to be vulnerable, to be transparent about what we are facing. And maybe the reason why scandals happen is because there's been a lack of accountability. Even in our everyday lives, the question would be, how are we being accountable to someone about maybe your relationship with your partner? Maybe your work ethic or, or the way you're approaching things at school? Or maybe even the way you treat your family, your parents or your siblings? Who is someone that is holding you accountable for your behavior, your conduct, your actions? You know, I've, I personally witnessed at my age right now, I personally witnessed different marriages actually falling apart. Couples separating after five years, seven years, ten years, even many years later on separating. And these couples are in the church, within the faith community. And yet, no one knew that they were struggling. 
No one had any idea that this couple or that couple that separated was struggling in their marriage. If only there were people who were brave enough and courageous enough to not only open themselves to one another, but to even ask and say, hey, how are you doing with your marriage? Or, hey, how, how are you doing with, with loving your, your husband or your wife? If we were brave and courageous enough to not just ask, but open ourselves to one another, to hold each other accountable, I think a lot of these issues will be preventable. I honestly believe that the Lord can move and redeem and restore and transform. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a sin in your life, whatever it is, the Lord can move and bring a change through His power. And why do we allow these things to happen? Simple, a lack of accountability. A lack of accountability. See, years ago, there was a season in my life where I was, I was struggling and stuck in my own faith, my own walk with God. And I was, de- I was dealing with, with this whole idea of recurring sin and, and shame. And I remember I was this great A Christian, you know, great A, got great B, great C, but I great A. Double, triple A great. I was this triple A great Christian who could say the right things, do the right things, fulfill all the checklists, but all within my own strength and my own will, thinking that I could overcome the sin or the shame, the cycle of sin that was happening in my life. And as long as I did whatever I could to conceal, no one would know that I'm struggling. It would be so shameful for others to know what was happening in my life. And I felt that my situation was exclusive, it was unique. I'm sure nobody else is struggling with this. I'm sure mine is the worst, mine is the most horrible. Nobody else will ever experience this kind of thing in their walk with God. And my relationship dropped, went to a whole down low. It had a big roadblock. I, I hit a big roadblock in my relationship with God. I was stuck in this cycle of, of sin and shame. And each time that I thought that I could get better, you know. Maybe I come to the altar call, repent, pray that I can repent, ask God to help me, but I don't share with anybody. I just continue to come crying and letting my my tears fill this carpet. And then I go back home and things happen again. It comes back again and goes through that whole cycle again. I thought that I could get better at it, but the only thing I could get better was is covering up, wearing masks, looking okay. I got better at that. And that was the issue. And finally, I came to the end of myself. I couldn't take it. I realized that there's, no, there's nothing else I can do with it. This is, this is just going to explode in my face or I can do something about this. So I reached out to two of my different brothers and I shared with them my struggle. I confessed my sin and I sought their help to pray with me, to hold me accountable. And the funny thing is that they did not reject me or condemn me. I thought they were going to score me and slap me on the face and say, bro, we thought you were better than this man. You suck now. I thought they were going to do that. But they didn't. They did not reject me or condemn me. In fact, they extended grace to me. And when, when I say grace, I meant that they extended correction, love, discipline, and accountability. When they extended that grace to me, I felt the love of God. They, they, they extended restoration to me. They prayed with me and shared even their own struggles with me. And suddenly I realized, hey, it's not just an exclusive problem to me. I thought I was Satan's number one enemy. But there were others who were going through different struggles as well. And instead of shame and guilt, there was freedom and redemption. It was God's love, hope, affirmation through these brothers of mine that didn't just help me up They didn't just pull me up, but walked alongside me, held me accountable, walked with me so that I can move forward. And God released me from the cycle of sin and shame, of isolation, thinking that that I was only the only one carrying it all on my own, to being held accountable, to aligning me to God's Word and with other fellow disciple makers. You see, friends, we all need someone who loves us enough to tell us that there's a piece of vegetable stuck between your teeth. We all need someone in our lives who loves us enough to tell us and turn in the face and say, hey, you haven't been brushing your teeth, man. I can smell it from here. 
you, last week you tried to smoke me. This week is double smelly. Please do something about it. We all need someone to tell us, to extend that grace to us. Maybe grace is more than just, yeah, I forgive you. Yeah, I pray for you. Maybe grace is about holding each other accountable with the word of God and say, hey, I love you so much as a fellow disciple maker, as a fellow brother and sister in Christ, that I'm going to hold you accountable. I want you to be the best disciple maker, the best version of who God has called you to be, more like Christ than what your past is. We all need that someone. We need fellow disciple makers who would be mirror holders for us, pointing out to us our blind spots. See, James 5 verse 16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And I believe that as disciple makers, the more open, the more transparent we are, the lesser the enemy will have to use against us. The more God is able to work with in and through our lives when we bring it before Him and others to hold us accountable. Would you turn to someone and say, accountability. See, God desires for us to extend grace towards all. God desires for us to extend grace towards all. And to extend God's grace to others, whether in the way we treat one another, to the way we care for those in need, and interact with those whom we serve and work with. We need to also extend grace to the leaders of this household and to resolve any issue with leaders in a godly or others with a godly and biblical manner. This is the disciple maker's compassion because our passion for Jesus must be consistent with our compassion for others. It is only this way that Christ can be glorified through His church. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, I believe the Holy Spirit is moving speaking to some of us. And the first group of people I want to speak to is in the area of compassion. The Lord is speaking to you today to show compassion to others. We have experienced God's grace towards our lives, but we have not been able to extend this grace to others, whether through spiritual or practical ways. And maybe it's because of the season of life that we are in but today, you sense the Lord is speaking to you and you're asking God, God, would you give me eyes of compassion for others? Lord, would you use me to be an extension of your grace to others? Lord, would you use me for your glory, God? If that's you across this place, no one looking around, just quickly slip out your hand so I can see it and you can put it down. Thank you. Thank you in the front and the middle. Thank you at the back as well. Thank you. Thank you in the front. Thank you. The second group that I would like to speak to is in the area of accountability. And as you were listening, the Holy Spirit is tugging something in your heart. Some of us may be stuck in a cycle of sin, shame, or even guilt. We feel powerless, we feel helpless. And in this time, to stop walking this journey alone. We read earlier in James 5, 16, there is power in healing when we confess to one another. When we surround ourselves with people that can hold up the mirror in our lives. And maybe some of us, we once were held accountable to someone, but that stopped, something happened and, and that stopped. And today, you sense the Lord is challenging you, speaking to you to take that bold step of faith to open up yourself to others to be consistent, to start maybe, maybe even in your grace group with someone or to look for a mentor or someone that can journey with you and hold you accountable. If that is when you're saying, God, help me to live in the fear of the Lord. Help me to take the step of faith to be accountable to others. If that is you right now, just lift up your hands. No one looking around. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The sides, the back. Thank you. If that's you, you're saying, yes, I want, Lord, I want to take this step of faith. I want to be accountable, not just to you, but to others, to those fellow disciple makers as well. If that's you, just quickly slip up your hands right now. No one looking around. Thank you at the side, in the front. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next gen, can we all stand to our feet? Let's all rise to our feet. As the worship team leads us in this next song, we're going to open up the altars. And I believe that some of us need to do an exchange with God right here. Not worry about the person on your left, on your right, on your row. But let this be a personal exchange between you and God right now. If the Lord is speaking to you to respond to Him, and you lifted up your hand earlier, or maybe you haven't lifted up your hand yet, but you know that the Lord is speaking to you, I want to encourage you, as the team leads us in this song, step up from your seats, come to the front. Let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord minister to you. We want to pray together with you. Our leaders, our pastors, we are here. So as they lead us, step up from your seats right now and come. The altars are open, come and respond to the Lord as Sarah leads us in the song. alongside with you to pray for you to have more compassion towards with God's the people power come of your holy spirit to open the rest of us let's worship the lord Lord we need your grace 